would ask now that you would come along with me to the word of the Lord as it is found in the gospel according to Matthew. We will be reading from chapter 16 beginning at verse 21. Once again, Matthew 16, beginning at verse 21. Let us now together listen to and for the word of the Lord as Matthew tells this part of the Passion story. He says there, from that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, be killed, and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid this, Lord. This must never happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. For you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. And then Jesus told his disciples, If any want to become my followers... Let them deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? For the Son of Man has come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay everyone for what has been done. And truly, I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. My friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? We thank you this day, O God, for the tremendous presence of your spirit. We thank you for those great saints who have been part of this church and part of our lives. And we know, O God, that you've already received them unto yourself. But this day we pray that their spirit might linger around to speak to us as we consider the fruit of faithfulness. So speak now, if you would, because your people are listening. Speak now, because your servant is listening. In the precious and powerful name of Jesus Christ, we pray, and the people of God all together said, Amen. Great is thy faithfulness. O God, our Father, there is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not the mercies, they fail not. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. These words recorded by Thomas Chisholm in the year of our Lord, 1923 written by a young fella who was born in a cabin in Kentucky. Grew up not so much a Christian, but converted to Christianity when he was 27. And at the age of 36, was so moved by his passion for Jesus that he entered the ministry. Unfortunately, he had debilitating illnesses that precluded his fully engaging ministry. And so he had to kind of settle back, tone down, get a desk job, a little circumscribed life. But yet and still he was able, through his pain and through the circumscribedness of his life, 
to write these words, great is thy faithfulness. And he went on to write over 1,200 poems and hymns throughout his lifetime. But most speak to the wonderful provision, love, generosity, and care of God that he experienced in his life. And so it is that we might stop and ask ourselves the question, what is this thing called faithfulness? What what might faithfulness look like? How might it be defined? Well, some, Steve, as you know, define it as meticulously uh, tending to a job and doing it thoroughly. That sound good to you? Uh, or someone, a uh, Jim, who is trustworthy, reliable. That sound good? This is where you say yes. I see the, they want me to work hard today. Or, 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 or somebody who is obedient. Or, or, or somebody who uh, uh, sees something all the way through. Uh, these are various and sundry angles and takes on what it means to be faithful. And I am so glad that in the providence of God, this fruit that we scheduled, and I swear we didn't match these things up, came on All Saints Sunday. Because this is a day when we celebrate the great saints of our church, especially those who have deceased throughout the past year. And I would say this to you, that I have eulogized most of those that we will celebrate today. And most of those were part of a very important generation, a generation the likes of which I don't know we will see again in our lifetime. I, I, I see some nodding now, so I think that you're all on board with me. Uh, that, 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 that this is a group uh, that has been characterized by Tom Brokaw. You all remember Tom? This is NBC Nightly. Yeah. As the greatest generation. Uh, and, and there are some characteristics of this generation I think that we might observe, take a lesson from, uh, that might profit us if we paid attention to it. Because this is a generation that was faith. Full. Well, what might they have done? Well, Fred, I'm glad you asked me that. Uh, it seems that the first characteristic uh, that they evidenced was a characteristic of personal responsibility. Oh, I'm getting hot now. Just, 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 hang on, it gets better. Uh, uh, personal responsibility. Uh, in other words, if they saw something that needed tended to, they would what? Do it. And in our culture today, I find that we are a culture of blamers. See if this sounds familiar. Not my job. It wasn't me. It was on fire when I put it down. An elephant stepped on it. My dog ate it. Whatever it was, it was not my fault. It was their fault. No, this is a generation that sucked it up. This is a generation, remember, who saw the end of World War I, went through the Great Depression, got through World War II, and built the infrastructure for most of what we know today. And why? Because they took what? Responsibility. Number two, humility. In other words, they didn't spend a whole lot of time puffing themselves up. You know, I say if there is a book to be written about current generations, it might be entitled, It's All About Me. I am the best thing since sliced bread. I, it, it, me, mine, I, me, my, it, it's all about me. We, we have to advance ourselves to lift ourselves over others. And in the process of lifting ourselves, we inevitably push other folk what? Are you with me here? But they were about humility. You know, but Lord, it's hard to be humble. Three, 
three, work ethic. Work ethic. They got up, washed their face, brushed their teeth, put on their clothes, got up off their rusty dusty, and went to what? Work. They didn't wait. And if there wasn't a job, they made one. And not only that, they took pride in what they did. I think I lost them there. When, when I said work. Work! Y'all remember Mena G? That's lost on anybody under 25. Work, work, work. You know, uh, we, we have uh, tasks to do, do we not? And I think this really uh, comes home when we think about life together in the church of Jesus Christ. Us got work. And the reason we're standing here in this sanctuary, amen, is because a group of folks a generation ago said what? Let's go to work. Four, prudent saving. I know I'm not going to get an amen on this one uh, because I see a lot of folks who are in the same shape as me who are two or three paychecks away from being insolvent. Amen. I, you know, um, if you read the literature... Many boomers who are now running up on retirement have zip. Now, there might be a cultural reason why this is so. You know, if you had lived through the Depression, can I get one amen in the back over there? Just just wave at me. Then that's a generation that always had like three cows in the freezer. Amen. Amen. And, and put up all kinds of vegetables, amen, and, 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 and always have some money put away, usually in the mattress, because they remember what happened to the banks. You know, some of us didn't remember what happened to the banks, so 2008 caught them way off guard. Think about it. Get back to me later. And so... Prudent savings. But you know, the last one that coincides with this day is faithful commitment. Faithful commitment. You know, it almost never failed to be the case as I got together and shared the lives of these wonderful saints that their marriages pretty much all lasted more than 50 years. Whereas today, we can't get folks to stay long, married longer than 50 minutes. Why is that? I think it's because when they made a commitment, follow me here, as they went to the altar, do any of y'all remember this? As, as, as they stood before God and the preacher, did this sound familiar? as they gazed lovingly into each other's eyeballs and they were so in love, L-U-B, love, and they said, I do for the rest of my life. They meant that. Was it easy? No, no, no. And, and, And so it is when I I speak to young people as they approach the altar. I I say, you know, we've talked about expectations. We've talked about change. uh, We've talked about in-laws. We've talked about outlaws. uh, You know, we talk about all this stuff. But, you know, irrespective of that, there's one thing that I need to have clear. That as you enter this, that you love each other ferociously. I mean, I want you to love each other like a pit bull and a ham bone. 
Are, are you with me here? I want you to latch on to that thing and, and clench them jaws because there's going to come a day when you won't be able to stand the sight of each other. Am I right about this? This I know I'm right. Say amen, right? right? And, 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 and you won't want to breathe each other's air. You won't want to look at each other. You don't want to. Ew! But you got to love each other what? Anyway! That's what it takes. They were loyal to each other. They were loyal to their country. They were loyal to their family. They were loyal to the church. Good, bad, or indifferent, this is my church. And I'm going to do whatever it takes to make disciples of Jesus Christ in this place. They were faithful. Faithful people. And you know who else was faithful? Jesus. You know, as I reflected on this whole faithfulness thing, I, 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 I reflected upon the passage that was read to our hearing from the Gospel of Matthew. And, and since all of you are biblical scholars, you, you know that there was a passage that preceded this one that was most important. You will remember that in that preceding passage, beginning at verse 13 of chapter 16, that Jesus asked his disciples this important question. Who do folks say that I am? Well, some say you're Elijah. Some say you're one of the prophets. Some say that. And then Jesus asked this very important question. And I'm asking it of you this morning. Who do? And Peter, as you remember, jumped up. And said, Jesus, you are the Christ. You are the son of the living God. And Jesus replies, blessed are you, Simon, for flesh and blood had not revealed that to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I tell you today that you are Peter. You are the rock. And upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And whatever you bind on earth, will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And that's an important text. Why is that important? Because in that part of the text, there is naming, there is blessing, and there is commissioning. Peter is named. The church is named. Peter is blessed. The church is blessed. Peter is commissioned. We're commissioned. And why is that important? Well, that's the easy part. How many of you know the hard part's coming? Because the beginning of our text for today at verse 21 says, from that point on, which is a hinge, which is saying that something's changing, things are rearranging, things are about to take a different direction. You see, at that point, Jesus turns his direction inward and reflects on and focuses on his disciples. He begins to teach them and shape them and form them, and inform them, and transform them, and get them ready for what's to come. Because what does he say after that? I'm telling you right now that the Son of Man has to go to Jerusalem, where he will suffer at the hands of the scribes, the priests, and the Pharisees. He will be killed. Well, it got real quiet here. And then be raised. And then Peter, once again, jumps up. Said, Lord, forbid that to be so. This can never happen to you. And then Jesus says what? Get the... Okay, what's so important about all of this? Well, this, this passage makes a very important theological statement. It says, first of all, that Jesus is the Son of God. He is the Christ. And it says that he came to die. Are you listening? And that that death was part of God's faithful providential plan for our salvation. 
and that Jesus was not a hapless victim, but rather he was a willing participant. And that, not only that, that we are called to follow him. Did you hear what, what followed that? Let he or she who would follow me deny themselves, pick up their cross, and what? So when he says to Peter, get thee behind me, he's not really rebuking Peter or consigning Peter to eternal damnation. He's just putting Peter in the right place. Because Peter needs to be what? Behind him, following. And it is also to say to us that we are called to be faithful disciples. That we are called to deny. We are called to pick up crosses. We're, we're called. So how does one do this faithful stuff? Well, I don't know. Well, yes, I do. First of all, we heed the words of, of, of the gospel writer in John, where John marvelously describes it in this way. Jesus says to his disciples, I am the vine and you are the branches. You could do nothing, what, apart from me. So first thing we ought to do is make sure that we are well grafted to the vine. Well, how do I do that? I don't, Steve said prayer. You think that's right? Uh, uh, We might read our Bible. Yeah, we, 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 we might fast, we might meditate, we might execute any of the spiritual doctrines. And when we talk about prayer, and, and I'm going to be unfolding this experience as we go along, my, my trip to Korea was illuminating. Because I got up at 4.15 air morning. Somebody say air. Air morning. For a prayer service that began at 5. And praying in earnest began at 5.30. And I sat there one morning just to see how long these folks would hang in there. And the last person that morning that I sat there left at 7.15 a.m. So that person was in there praying from 5.30 a.m. Anybody want to join me? It got quiet again. Did you notice that? (laughs) Secondly, we have to be able to resist temptation. And Lord knows there's enough stuff to tempt us out there, is there not? If if you want to get close to God, just be ready because a a million and one distractions are coming. Oh, it's time to read my Bible. I'm going, look what's on TV. Are you with me here? I mean, there are distractions everywhere. You have to rely on the resource of God's precious Holy Spirit to to strengthen yourself inside and to help you develop wholesome, holy habits that will keep you connected to God. And, And last, this is where you say amen. I'm not that bad, though. You know, a little bread and wine, you know, and you're done like that. When you get knocked down, get yourself back up. Are you you with me here? Because a whole lot of folks who are Christians that I know, when they fail, they feel like they can never, ever be okay in God's sight again. Are, Are you with me here? Just nod if you know what I'm talking about. But if you get knocked down, get up! Because God's still got something for you to do. Because another definition of faithfulness is to follow through on your commitment even though things get difficult. Nobody promised that this was going to be easy. 
But God did promise that there is a reward. And so it is that at the end of this day, we pray that we might all hold hands together and veritably shout to God. Because God is the one who is always faithful. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me.